said, yeah, like, he played for the NBA. And then he, he went on more detail about, like, how, like, his, uh, his shooting ability and stuff and, like, more, like, specific details about his career. Well, the interesting thing about it, he asked who Mitch Richmond was and said, I have no idea. He said, do you know who Mitch Richmond, the NBA player, was? And they were able to draw from that uh, information, that data yes, set, yes. to connect to all the things that spit out. Yeah. Well, he just said Mitch Richmond. I, I don't know who that is. You need more specifics. More data. Yes. And so the more data you give something, like your chat GPT, right. the more it can spit out to you in terms of what it is precisely that you're looking for. Anything generic? Yeah. Yeah. So that was what I, I learned from it. But Weta Tools and Unity together are now trying to find partners to create story um, and create things like what we just saw that will allow business... Um, enterprise or anybody to figure out how they can create something customized for themselves that would use that kind of avatar. Well, wasn't it? Wouldn't be an avatar. I guess it was a really four-dimensional character that you know was from a planet, from a place, and ask that person a question in ways where you can have entertainment and your your exchange with it, and asking literally questions that you might not even want to answer for in real time. And that's one of the things that I realize is that if there's data and data sets that have computated how that data can be brought back to you, depending on the walls that you set up, it may not want to ethically talk about that, especially in front of an audience. Because he asked it a pretty risque question, and it spit it back, you know. So whoever programmed this AI said, okay, well, we'll let him talk about something that's X-rated. But there's some AI that won't allow you to talk about anything because they programmed it to stop just short of some things. So I realize that everybody's got to have their own customized AI. Or they will be fearful of somebody else's AI really, you know, not only replacing you, but interpreting who you are. So, tell me a little bit about how you know all this stuff. Where did it come from? How did it happen that you can actually be knowledgeable about these things? About AI or... About anything that you can actually share with us about how you obtain this knowledge. The knowledge. Okay. Wow, that's a big question. And the application of it, you know. Yeah, I have... Um, okay, is it basically... Get together. Come together. Oh, actually, get in there, too. Also, like, more about work, would you say? Well, or? I would say... Your ability to customize what you've learned to the things that you like to do, maybe that you're passionate about. Uh, yeah, sure. uh, well, I and, uh, here's, here's, I'm going to edit this. Tell me where you came from geographically, anything yeah. culturally, yeah. and all the things that have allowed you to become the best version of yourself right now. If you guys get get in closer, I want to try to get. Everybody's got deodorant, right? <laughs> so basically, um, this is also something that I had when I talked yesterday. Um, I am a Turkish person, but I was born in Germany, so I lived in Germany and studied in Germany. So it was always like this question of you know when I started studying. 
study about how we visual media. So it was super interactive. We had like insights of our games, about shows or events. And I figured out I'm really into animation and also visual effects. So we got deeper into it, like how we make films and how things are behind the screen. Um, there was always this question for me, it's like, where do I belong or do I belong? Because it's always this confrontation of your own identity in on-screen representation, especially when you don't see yourself on screen, which was for me especially coming from a Muslim community or a no belief, but also having Turkish cultures. Um, I don't see that representation on screen, to be honest. And when it's like the big films, especially the hero films and animation movies or commercials, um, I didn't see myself there, to be honest. And then I started having resources about it, researching about it, you know, what is the statistic, what can we do about it. I figured out the percentages are pretty low. It's below 1%, the on-screen representation of Muslim communities or, you know, a positive representation about it. So with that one, being in the industry and learning about VFX, you know, it's a tool for me, um, you know, bringing all the elements together, what is in my mind. And in projects, basically, it's the last step in VFX to do compositing. So what we do is we get, get like all the layers from animation departments, from simulation departments, like all the water simulation, all the, you know, effects that happen to extend what is in our mind, what we capture in real life. So for me, it was a tool to be able to see, okay, this is what I can do technically with the tools that we have in order to bring the visual landscape or the creative landscape that I would like to see in the future. So I started getting more resources about AI tools, about, you know, also techniques in VFX, how we can change the landscape, the visual landscape, in order to get a broader, a more diverse, um, yeah, representation, or representation, or anything like that. And I feel this is like our responsibility for all of us to to ask ourselves where do we belong and do I belong in this industry? And if there is any kind of marginalization feeling, we have to change it to the normalization. And with that, it is the tools that we have, the creative tools. Um, it is interactions, it is empathy and caring, it's the team building that we have. Um, it is this kind of situation that we have that we interact and share um, in order to be in this industry and to change the narrative of the industry. And that's why I feel the responsibility for me to use the technical tools, um, but also trying ones to see where can we go in the future. Right. right. Okay, last question. Tell me about your presentation you did yesterday. What was it about and how you felt about um, the exchange between you and the audience? Yeah, sure. Um, my talk yesterday was about the art of inclusion, how representation shapes the future. So um, that was exactly what I was talking about. Um, the question that I came was, and I felt like we have, um, you know, misrepresentation costs and um, losing audiences, losing the potential of storytellers, of creative untold stories that we have in the world, but it's also maybe, and you know, if you go into the extreme, and the lost potential of lives, right? So it is the interaction, it is the empathy that we have with each other, but people believe a story and people don't just wake up and hate underrepresented groups. They believe a story that they see on screen in the mainstream media. And once we have no interaction with those cultures, or beliefs, or societal groups, we do believe on the story that we have in the mainstream area. So for me, it was important to share the statistics uh, where we are at for LGBTQ plus communities, for you know people with disabilities, for religious diversity that we never talk about because it's always highlighted in you know specific groups and um, tropes, let's say. Um, and for me, it was important to showcase the the bigger dimension of statistics and why representation matters, so that we have the interaction, that we feel the understanding, and especially.
touch the empathy part. In order to have inclusion, we need to be able to learn the empathy, to see where the lack is of representation. I feel like we talk mostly in conferences about the technical um, innovation, where this goes to AI and everything. But I want to stop and come back. It's like the first thing that we really need is empathy and understanding and listening in order to process what we really lack in the mainstream media. Um, and with that, you know, what we need to do that companies uh, and studios need to champion underrepresented groups and projects that they have to invest in them, that they have to trust about their stories, that we need internship and mentorship programs that, you know, give access for underrepresented groups to get into the industry because it is well known that it's really hard for those groups to enter the industry, to have like those biases and to be honest, it's kind of a discrimination too. Like if you cannot enter it, so where should you start to give your stories and share your stories, right? Um, and it was also for me to talk about it. It was really um, moving for me to get this interaction um, with the audiences because some of them had also stereotypical questions, you know, um, that they feel like if, let's say, Muslim representation needs to be more on screen, that we need more people um, in, in the teams. And they said that it's, um, that it's, for example, the more Muslim people you have, the more Muslim stories you have. I was like, this is not correct, because we don't want to talk, not everyone wants to talk about their own stories, right? I mm. just want to be in the field, I just want to exist, I just want to be visible doesn't mean that I'm just talking about Muslim representation. So if there's like one black person, it doesn't mean that they just talk about their own cultures and about their own identities. This shouldn't be that way. Because if we do so, it's just about being egoistic and talk about our own stories. It's not sharing, it's not mixing cultures. It is the fact that we need more people. Yes, we need more people in the groups, in the teams, post-production and on screen and behind the camera it doesn't mean that this is a valid point uh, to do those things All right so i lied one last thing yeah. do you guys have any questions for kadera anything you like to say about what she said because she comes from the diversity and inclusion department here and gary any thoughts about anything she said that resonated with you I mean, I would like to see more Asian actors, I mean, in the industry, so that would be, like, really cool. Um, as far as questions, though, not really Statements, sure. any remarks, anything that reacts, any reaction? Um, I mean, what she said was, like, very, like, factual, and, uh, I mean, the stats don't lie and everything. I think that, um, it goes for everybody, like, it's even, like, I mentioned, the, uh, you know, LGBTQ community and everything, and, um, or disabled people, like, it, it all, like... I feel like we as, I don't know, humans, I feel like, because AI is taking over and everything, but I feel like the, just like the, the whole storytelling part is becoming very, like, tricky today, because, like, even, like, Disney is, like, kind of running out of ideas, I feel like, um, but there's also, like, a lot of, like, political stuff happening in today's world, in today's time. Um, especially with the writers' strike and the actors' uh, strike and everything, so. Um, but it's a. Uh, I think it's a time to really reflect on everything. Uh, but I can't think of anything like specific to like ask or anything. But uh, that's what I'm just noticing. And, but today is pretty cool. Like everything you're watching and just hearing everybody like say their story and say their piece was really cool. Okay, great. Thank you, Shane. Any reflection to what Kadir said? Um, yeah, you know, it would be more of a. Of a um, just you know agreeing with everything that you said and kind of like where my mind is um, being in a world and raising children uh, who are very small during this this precedence this, this particular point in time where technology is really growing at a massive rate and those points that you make as far as inclusion as far as uh, the compassion and the empathy you know I feel like like AI and the tools that are out here when used properly can help to cultivate that, you know, in terms of social engineering, you know, creating that and 
children as early as possible. So usually my question that I ask people is, you know, how early should this process begin? You know? Yeah, how early should, should that process begin? And I usually answer it myself because I'm very, you know, um, passionate about it and it's my personal experience too. But I'm always curious for people like how, how early should should children start learning AI and 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 even more specifically learning um, the culture of compassion. Okay. Well, I think before learning AI, that's my personal opinion. Before children learn AI, they have to first learn themselves, their own identity, their own culture, their whatever they are or want to be, before they get into the world of AI. Because it can be very tricky, because this is exactly what I want to say. If you see something visually all the time, people feel like they are those people, or they are whatever they want to see. And I think there is a really thin line between to learn the creative process but also if you don't know who you are you can get lost in it and you have to make sure that you have a strong character and you have like the baseline of yourself in order to jump on that train and you have you need to have like also the point of where you can just step back because I feel like with social media or with AI, anything, AI is the step after it. Um, people get lost. People get lost in their own identities, in their own self-worth, in their self-esteem, in whatever their ideal is. And I feel like the system goes to the perfection also with AI. So like it's like you need to be this creative, you need to be that beautiful, you need to be, if you want to imagine like this wonderful world, this is this is the world you're living in, but we have to be able to see that we're living in this world. Yes. So we want to make sure that we want to make this world more beautiful instead of that AI world. It's just an inspiration source, I feel like. And that's why I would recommend it not for children to jump on it because they have to acknowledge in which world they are living in in well, order get in the picture, to jump get in the picture. on a different world. And for me, is AI is a different world, and you have to make sure you know this world in order to jump on the next one. That's great. Yeah, so you don't that's get great. That's a great thing. Thank great. you. And, and yeah. Shoni, we're going around the room. You didn't hear um, what Kader said, but she's a speaker um, yesterday, and she had some thoughts and reflections about her speech. Um, but we're talking about empathy, young people learning AI at the very earliest age and how they can use this for their identity, creating their identity and be able to use it as a tool to help create maybe more comfort and care about how they can share their identities, not just with their own people, but with the rest of the world. Any thoughts you may have on how we can use AI to help children start to use it at an early age and, and in a more you know, organic way? In a more organic way? Yeah, instead of just tools and AI. It's a good question. I've never really heard I know it's a good that. question, but... Well, I'm going to come back to you as you listen to Alex and Kayla, because she was able to hear Kadir. Any I thoughts and reflections? I back to the original thing she was talking about, and it was more about the empathy and, you know, what we're showing on screen. I loved everything you said because that's exactly what I pour into my writing, especially about like cross cultures, you know, just showing, like just because you brought up a great point where they were saying that we have more Muslim writers and they're going to talk about Muslim stories, that do you stop enjoying everything else and having your interest in your personality just because of your religion? It's, it's nice to highlight that, but that doesn't, you shouldn't equate the two. Exactly. And so I really love what you were saying about empathy because when you have marginalized groups, who are used to being portrayed in these stereotypes, that's how they see themselves. Like That's exactly why I pursued film, because it's such a powerful teaching tool. In college, I made so many international friends, and they told me, you know, as they got to know me better, that this was probably one of their first experiences with a black person, and based on what they used to see in media versus what they're experiencing in real life was completely different. And so I think it's really important to have filmmakers of all backgrounds, especially writers, highlight not only themselves but other people and the interaction they have. Like I, we have, a, I'm incredibly fortunate and privileged to live here in California, where I've interacted with so many different cultures, and I'm working on a story right now, and it's about three different 
essentially minorities as the main characters and like they borrow from their own cultures and each other's cultures and it's just how they exchange with each other because that's exactly what my life looked like with all the different friends I had so I definitely loved everything you said because that's exactly what I believe in and what I want to write about so I just can't believe it. Great. Great. What I remembered right now with the statistics, it's over a half of a century that the statistics didn't change. Wow. So we kind of just believe that things are on the way, it is changing, but really small. It's like a few percentages. So it's crazy that honestly, none of us in this room have seen a fully woman, LGBTQ, BPOC, you know, people with disabilities characters in yeah. stories because the numbers haven't changed. And it's crazy that we need to give to the next generation the ability to see that kind of narrative. Wow. What you said. Yeah. Because if the numbers don't change, we will never able to give it to the next generation. And so it's our responsibility to maybe see films that have those highlights sometimes and it has a sweet aftertaste. But I think this is the way of changing the narrative for the next generation. Great. And uh, if these numbers persist, that's what AI is going to use. Like AI doesn't know any yeah, better versus exactly. what's already out there. Like right. it's exactly. all the time. So we have to be able to, you know, still put other things out there so exactly. that it like shifts the ratio at the very least. So then yeah. everyone feels included and you know considered. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So Kayla, thoughts and reflections about anything you can remember what Kader said. Um, I had a point, but then every time someone spoke, my point and perspective changed. <laughs> But um, I just want to thank her for speaking to us, um, giving us the new knowledge, because on my level, I was more so, like you said, everybody thinks diversity is just different people from different cultures representing just their culture. But I do like how I can represent something else outside of what I want to push. Um, so I do, I, I, I appreciate that. Great. And Tony, um, we're wrapping this up. Um, we're talking about some of Kadir's thoughts and reflections about her panel diversity and inclusion anything that you can share with us about DNI and all your initiatives for how you know we're pushing SIGGRAPH to to an outer reaches of people that maybe don't know anything about it well I'm, I'm appreciative that uh, Kadar is actually elevating the topics of interest for a lot of people in the community that actually don't feel that they do have a place where they belong or they don't see imagery or people who are representative of who they are as individuals on this planet. So what we're trying to do is create spaces where people feel safe and have a space where they belong. And then also trying to connect strategically how these people can uplift the entire organization that will build a greater organization in the end. So that's kind of what we're trying to do, and I'm glad that our executive body, as well as uh, our parent organization, uh, Association Computer Mission, is very supportive of our efforts thus far. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing because DEI representative in this space and community is broader than the typical norm in the Western U.S. as uh, basically ethnicity and race. It's more around the disciplines that bring together innovation, creativity, and actually helps Seagraph be better in moving the community forward to future generations. Okay, great. Okay, and Sony, any last comments All right, here we about go. what you saw, what you hear, and what you can add? You can take us home uh, as right. one of the young people. I mean, you take us home, I guess. Uh, yeah, so in terms of just talking about some reflections about AI and its impact on diversity and inclusion and things of that nature. I think that the powerful thing about AI is that it's a great um, resource that depending on what we build right now as a community for gathering information, AI can use that information to then spread that awareness to creators in the future. So I, I, I can only think in a two mindset, unfortunately. So for me, um, I can see how it can impact young youth and young writers and people who want to be talking about um, specific stories that they may not have no idea about. And when I talk about a story that takes place in China, but they've never been to China, they have met someone who's Chinese before, but now through the power of this AI, 
they're able to converse with people who are digital copies of Chinese people, or that has all the information of China, or connects them to a network of other people that are also writing, and help them come together to create that story and really become inclusive, so to speak. So I can see a couple ways of doing it um, in terms of like what AI can do. Um, my, my my sentiments on diversity and inclusion is as I feel that it's important to get people to see. I think it's important to have everybody um, have their their time to to shine, to have their ability to come onto the stage on equal footing with anybody else and to be properly represented. I also think that it's important to not um, have that step upon the, the creative expression of, of humor and comedy where there's cancel cultures happening just because of, of a poorly made joke. I think mm. that if that ends someone's career, it, it just scares people and limits the creativity of them. So I feel that um, the other thing to keep inclusive is one's creativity and imagination. I think it's important to understand that sometimes not all media should be taken 100% serious. It's literally just for entertainment and fun. Just that, by the same token, there's films made to drive and impact people and change lives. There's plenty of stories for that. For me, it was uh, The Matrix, so. Okay, okay. <laughs> great. And, and what I'm going to do, yeah. I want to get a picture of all you guys, including Tony. Tony, can we get in this picture? And Alara, can you get, I'm going to take a picture of all of us here. In the, the yes. Hey, Q. 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 I want, I want to get you in this picture. Okay, everybody squeeze in. We all have deodorant, right? Come on. <laughs> Didn't matter if we did, but okay. Okay, squeeze in as much as you can. Okay.